All right, grace and peace to everybody. Thank God for your presence this evening. Uh, we're grateful for this opportunity to share in Bible study. I um, want to thank again Dr. Patterson, who did a, a, a fabulous job um, dealing with Black history. It was great. We enjoyed it. Um, and um, I spoke with her, and 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 we've been talking and sharing, and so I, it's just been it's been a great opportunity uh, for us to be able to do. Uh, we are back to the Gospel of John. Back to the Gospel of John. We are almost completed with the Gospel of John. Um, we're going to pick up um, at the 17th chapter. The last uh, thing we did was the end of chapter 16. So we're going to uh, pick up tonight at the beginning of chapter 17. But uh, of course, before we do that, we're going to open up in prayer. God, we're grateful and we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together to share one with another in the study of your word. Please, Lord, we pray now that you open up our, our understanding, open up our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our hearts to uh, receive all that you have uh, in store for us this night. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Let every heart say amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. So the Gospel of John, let's begin with... Uh, the first verse of the Gospel of John, um, and I actually want to stop at, at the, the A portion of that first verse. It says that Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, let's, let's stop there. Before we get into what he said, um, I, I want to share that the Bible is filled with great prayers. Uh, the Bible is filled with great prayers. We have uh, the prayer of Abraham. Um, in Genesis. We have the prayer of Moses in Exodus. We have the prayer of Solomon um, in 1 Kings and in 2 Chronicles. We have the prayer of Hannah um, in 1 Samuel. We have David's prayer um, in Psalm 51. We talked about that this morning in our prayer call. Um, there's Saul, uh, rather Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, um, but many argue, brothers and sisters, that this prayer found in John chapter 17 is by far the greatest recorded prayer in the Bible. Jesus prayed this prayer unto his God and Father, um, which is the only long, continuous prayer of Jesus that is recorded in the Gospels. Uh, every other prayer is a short prayer, but this is an extensive prayer. In fact, this entire chapter is uh, the prayer that, that Jesus offers to, to God the Father. Uh, the sentences of the prayer are simple, but the ideas are deep, they're moving, and they are meaningful. Um, and I just wanted to share with you that genuine prayer often reveals a person's innermost being. Um, and John 17 is a unique opportunity to see the nature and the heart of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as he shares in this prayer to the Father. Um, many of the same concerns of what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, but we know that it's really not the Lord's Prayer, it's a model prayer. Um, he tells his disciples, when thou pray, pray our Father, which art in heaven, in Matthew chapter six, um, are, are common in this prayer. So a lot of the things, some of the things that he shares in that prayer or in that model prayer, um, he does in this prayer. Um, all prayer is repeatedly directed to God. There is recognition of and concern for God's name. Um, there is concern for the work of the kingdom, um, and there is concern uh, from keeping from evil. The same kind of thematic uh, things that we see in that model prayer are kind of exercised in this prayer. Yet, th there's, there's, uh, there's something that's different in this prayer. Jesus did not pray uh, just as he told his disciples to pray. The request of our Lord given in John 17 chapter is clearly no prayer of inferiority um, um, to a superior uh, to a superior person, um, which is constantly seen in in our prayers or in other prayers or even in that model prayer. But this particular prayer is a prayer wherein we see Jesus, who is the one speaking, of course, who is co-equal with God. 
Um, and the two have but one mind. So I want you to keep that in mind as we as we uh, travel through this prayer, um, because you're going to see that this prayer is just a little bit different um, than other prayers when we who are inferior pray to a God who is superior. So in this prayer, Jesus is praying as someone who is one with God the Father. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first thing that I want us to look at <clears throat> is the posture of his prayer. In that first verse, it says that Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven. Now, um, th this is a posture that we don't usually associate with prayer. In, in the prayer customs of the Western world, we often bow our heads, close our eyes, um, and we tell folks, bow your heads, close your eyes, right, when we, when we pray. Um, but Jesus prayed with the customs of, of prayer that's common to his day. Um, in John 11 and 41, um, it talks about how he lifted up his eyes. Um, Mark 7, 34, he lifted up his eyes. Even the psalmist tells us in the 123rd Psalm, about how they lifted their eyes to pray to God. So Jesus's posture of looking up in prayer indicates that this prayer is a prayer of faith and a prayer of confidence, even in victory, all the while acknowledging the reality of the conflict that he's dealing with. So this prayer is by the one who in John 16, 33, shares with his disciples that he has overcome the world. This remarkable prayer is made with a heart and a mind looking up towards heaven. And Jesus made no mention of his problems or the decisions he must make. His heart and mind were fixed on the highest things, pledging himself to the absolute fulfillment of God the Father, um, his will, no matter what the cost was, so that eternal life could come to others. It's interesting when we look at this prayer uh, in comparison to the prayer um, that is done in the synoptic gospels when we're in this same narrative. Um, this prayer seems to be a little different. Um, and it says in those other um, synoptics, it says that he prayed three times. Um, before he went to trial. Um, but John simply shares this lengthy prayer that Jesus offers. And um, those other prayers only give one portion, and that is, Lord, let this bitter cup pass from me, not my will, but thine will be done. That's, that's what they focus on in the prayer. Um, and they also focus on the fact that when Jesus went to pray, um, he asked them to pray and they fell asleep praying. But in this prayer that John shares, John shares uh, the extent of the prayer that Jesus offers before his arrest, um, trial, and crucifixion. In the second portion or the second part of uh, this first verse, Jesus continues by saying, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son also may glorify you. Now, all of the times before this time, Jesus's hour of, glor of glorification had not come. John 2, 4, what did he tell his mother? My hour has not come. John 7, 8, my hour has not come. John 7, 30, my hour has not come. John 8, 20, my hour has not come. But now the hour has come. Um, he said it to his disciples in the 12th chapter and now reiterates it in this prayer to the Father. Please note, sisters and brothers, the words that he uses um, when he starts this prayer. Father, your son, your, your son, you. This prayer um, is, a, is, is deep with and rich with uh, relationship. Um, and it shares the relationship. And if you remember the entire time that Jesus is at the table, he is establishing his relationship with the father. He's establishing their relationship to him, and he's establishing that they are all related, unified together as one. 
So he continues even in this prayer with that same theme about relationship. Um, Jesus prayed with a full and deep sense of familial relationship and the natural hierarchy or order that exists between God the Father and God the Son. Um, so Jesus prayed first for himself, um, but his petition was not a selfish petition. His concern for himself was actually a concern for the glory of the Father to be revealed. The Son can only glorify the Father if the Father first answers the prayers of the Son. So Jesus says, glorify your Son. The hour has come, glorify your son. It is time for the cross now, Father, and it is the death of the cross that will glorify the son. So the cross um, was utter humiliation to the world, but it was an instrument of glorification in the eyes of God. The cross was capital punishment to the world, but was the ultimate means of reconciliation with the Father to those who believe. The cross was a symbol of weakness to the world, but was the wisdom and the strength of God to those who call upon the name of the Lord. The cross may be foolishness to the world, but the cross is power, the power of God to those who are being saved. This is an aspect um, of the foolishness and weakness of the cross that Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians. And this prayer, was wonderfully answered. Yes, the father did glorify his son, even when it pleased him to bruise his son and to put grief on his son. With one hand, he smote Jesus. And with the other hand, he glorified Jesus. There was a, a power to crush, but there was also a power to sustain um, that was working at the same time time. So the father glorified his son through the work of the cross. And the reason why Jesus needed to be glorified by the father was so that your son, that's what he says in the text, your son also may glorify you. In, in its counterintuitive work, the cross glorified Jesus, the son, and displayed the wisdom and the power of God. Yet it also glorified God the Father by displaying his wise plan and great sacrifice in giving the Son to do such a work. Uh, my, my sisters and brothers, you remember that because sin entered into the bloodstream of man, there was a debt set forth by God that had to be paid for the wages of sin is death, right? But God's infinite wisdom hooked us up before the foundations of the earth and set a plan in motion to pay the debt that God knew we could not pay. And on the cross through Jesus Christ, our debt was paid in full. So the father glorified Jesus and Jesus glorified the father at the same time on the cross. Now, uh, this act on the cross reveals the sovereignty of our God, the sovereignty of our God over sin, the compassion of our God for all mankind, and the finality of the redemptive process for all of those who believe. Songwriter said, what can wash away our sins? Nothing, but, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, I don't know how deep we want to go into this, but that's why in the beginning, God accepted Abel's offering and not Cain's offering because it was the wrong kind of offering. It was not the kind of offering that God wanted. God wanted a blood offering because only by the shedding of blood 
is their remission of sin. So y'all, so 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 that's why God didn't accept Cain's offering. It was the wrong kind of offering. God desired a blood offering because the blood offering um, is what purifies. So that's why Jesus, the only sacrifice he could make um, for the remission of our sins is through the blood that was shed on Calvary. Only his blood was able to pay the debt that God imposed on us that he knew we could not pay. All right. So Jesus gave several reasons on why or several grounds for this prayer, glorify your son. Um, he shares, glorify your son because the hour had come. We shared that, 17.1. He shares, glorify your son because in this, the father will be glorified. Glorify your son because authority had already been given to grant eternal life to Jesus. That's in 17.2. We'll get there in a moment. Glorify your son because Jesus is the only way to life. That's in 17.3. Because it finishes the work that the Father sent Jesus to perform, Jesus needed to be glorified. Verse 2 picks up by saying, you have given him authority, power, authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus claimed authority over all flesh with the ability to give eternal life to mankind. This is a clear and startling claim to his deity. And all throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about his deity, his equality with God the Father, his oneness with God the Father. Here he, he, uh, he um, specifically says that you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you, God, have given him, talking about Jesus. Now, this gives us new hope for all of our evangelistic efforts, all of our missional efforts, knowing that Jesus has authority over all flesh. Even for those who reject Jesus or are ignorant of him, even if they do not know it or acknowledge it, Jesus has authority over all flesh, all mankind, right? So we can pray in faith and ask Jesus to exercise your authority over those who have yet to repent and yet to believe. And because he has the authority over their flesh, over all flesh, um, Jesus can exercise his authority in the saving of all that he desires to be saved. Philippians 2. And five is a demonstration of this, that all will recognize the authority of Jesus. It says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All right. He has authority over everybody. And here it is. We can either acknowledge his authority now or we're going to have to acknowledge his authority later, all right? And here's the deal. If we accept his authority now, we can be saved. But if we reject his authority, then we'll have to deal with his judgment. Verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. All right. 
Jesus did not wait until his work on the cross to glorify God the Father. His entire life glorified God on earth. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus glorified the Father through his whole life, from his dedication at the temple, um, through his quiet years of obedience in Nazareth. Jesus glorified the Father through his faith, obedience, and work through the years of his earthly ministry. Every sermon preached, every blind or sick person healed, every bit of instruction and training for the disciples, every confrontation with the corrupt religious leaders, every question that he answered, every loving touch that he gave, they all glorified God the Father. So Jesus said he glorified the father on earth and he finished the work. Jesus, with divine confidence and assurance, saw the work on the cross as already finished. There was, of course, a sense in which the work um, still needed to be done. But since Jesus is that lamb that was already slain, since the foundation or before the foundation of the, of the world, as uh, according to Revelation 13, there's a greater sense in which the work that was already finished, completed in the heart and the mind of God, now it just had to be done in time, what was already done in eternity. All right. So um, Jesus asked the father, he says, glorify him. Um, but with the same glory that the Father himself has. Jesus' prayer was in no way an expression of independence, but of utter dependence upon God the Father. He, throughout this entire gospel, I don't do anything of myself. I do everything of the one who sent me. He's constantly talking about his uh, interdependence. Uh, he's always talking about his connection with God the Father. He continues by saying, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Um, don't forget that in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was fully aware of his preexistence and of the nature of that preexistence. Jesus understood there was a time in eternity past when God the Son and God the Father enjoyed a shared glory. The reality is that Jesus could not truly uh, or even sanely pray this prayer if he were not God himself, equal with God the Father. According to Isaiah, uh, the 42nd chapter, and Isaiah the 48th chapter, Yahweh proclaimed that he shares his glory with no one. If God the Father and God the Son share their glory, then they must both be Yahweh because they are one. There is no division in the Godhead. So the Gospel of John emphasizes the glory of Jesus throughout its entire record. John was careful to record um, the many ways Jesus referred to his own glory in this prayer. The life of Jesus was a man manifestation of God's glory and the disciples beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth, John 1, 14. The miracles of Jesus manifested his glory. The Jesus only ever sought the glory of his father. The revelation of glory is the reward of faith. Many times, Jesus spoke of his coming passion, his crucifixion, as his coming glorification. God the Son seeks to glorify God the Father. God the Father glorifies God the Son. So after Jesus prays regarding him and the father being glorified, then the prayer moves to Jesus being concerned about his disciples. Watch them. I've manifested your name to the men whom you have given me 
out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Jesus uh, must have been considering or thinking about the three years or so of ministry um, and teaching, which uh, his chosen disciples um, had received, oh. and, and summarizes it. Um, in this phrase, it indicates that Jesus didn't simply teach about the name of God, but he actually manifested and displayed the name or the character of God. Jesus lived out the very love, the goodness, the righteousness, the grace, the holiness um, that is exemplified in God the Father. He manifested God's character to each and every one of them. He's talking about his disciples, right? And we as believers today have a similar call and a similar duty to live out the character of our God. Paul wrote that believers are like living letters read by the world with the responsibility to manifest the name and the nature of God to a watching world. My brothers, my sisters, the world is watching us. And it is our responsibility to live out the very nature of the God whom we believe, the God whom we serve, the God whom we say is living inside of us. And Jesus chose his disciples after a night of prayer, expressing his total dependence upon God um, in choosing the men. That's back in Luke chapter six. Truly, it can be said that God the Father gave these men to Jesus and gave them out of the world. That's why Jesus says, you have given them to me and they have, rece and they have received them and have known that, that uh, I have come from you and they have believed that you sent me. All right, um, so, Ju so, uh, so truly it can be said that, the, that God the Father gave these men to Jesus and gave them out of the world. Y'all remember he says, you know, uh, lay down your nets, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Um, so he, he took them from out of the world um, and made them into the disciples that would follow him. Now watch this. Judas had departed from this group of disciples sometime earlier that evening. Uh -huh. With Judas gone, Jesus could truly say, the men you have given me, right? Um, they were yours. You gave them to me. This is another hint at the workings of the, uh, of the persons of the Trinity in what could be called a division of labor. There, there was some sense in which the disciples first belonged to God the Father. Then they were given to God the Son and soon would be left in the hands of God the Holy Spirit. Keep pressing. Verse 9, I pray for them. Um, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Verse 9 and 10. Jesus specifically had his disciples in mind in this prayer. He did not pray in a general sense for the world, but instead Jesus prayed for the disciples who would carry his message of love and redemption to the outside world. Jesus had um, a special focus upon them in this prayer because he knew these disciples belong to the Father, for you, uh, for they rather are yours. They're yours, God. Jesus already spoke of the shared glory between God the Father and God the Son. Here he spoke of their shared role in the life of the redeemed, that believers belong to both God the Father and God the Son. Ooh, I guess that, that cancels out what some of our other brothers and sisters say who are um, Jehovah only, 
um, because according to Jesus, we, we belong to both God the Father and God the Son, right? So we can't just be Jehovah only because we belong to God the Son just as much as we belong to God the Father. That's another discussion for another day. Everything we have belongs to God, but not everything he has belongs to us. Um, anyone can say to God the Father, all mine are yours, but only Jesus could say, and yours are mine. Another indication of Jesus and God being one. We can't say that all of God's is ours, but Jesus can. Um, Jesus says, I'm glorified in them. In a sense, this is what it means to be a believer, right? To be born again, to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, to have him glorified in us. Jesus does not merely want to dwell in or live in the believer, but to be glorified in him, to be magnified, to be exalted in him. Are y'all with me here? Because what's the sense of having Jesus living inside of us if Jesus is not being glorified? And here's the question that we need to ask. Do, uh, does our life glorify the one who lives inside of us? Does our life glorify the one who redeemed us? Does our life glorify the one who by the cross was glorified by the Father? Um, does that one, is he glorified in our lives? All right, so uh, no one other than Jesus should be glorified in the believer. Leaders have a tendency to glorify themselves in their followers. But it should only be Jesus. We have to stop allowing people to be glorified. I'll say that again. We got to stop, first of all, glorifying people and allowing people to be glorified. If at any point a leader or anybody else is being glorified, then there's a problem because the only one that ought to be glorified is Jesus Christ, All right? Um, because watch this, ain't none of us was crucified for the madness. None of us endured the cross for anybody else. None of us, you know, sacrificed our life so that some others might live. So only Jesus ought to be glorified. That's why we gotta take each other off these pedestals. We gotta stop lifting each other up and lift up Jesus. Jesus is the only one that ought to be glorified. All right, verse 11. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given to me, that they may be one as we are one. Remember, I was sharing with you that this entire conversation that's taking place at the dinner table um, here is an attempt of Jesus to show his connection to the Father then to show our connection to him. And as a result, we are all connected and interconnected together. That's why I write in chapter 15, when we talk about I am the vine, you are the branches. Um, our father is the husbandman. We are all interconnected in this thing, right? So Jesus prayed this entire prayer with his soon departure in mind. He realized that he would no longer remain in the world, but his disciples would. So they needed special prayer. Now watch this, y'all. They needed special prayer um, because the unique three years of discipleship during his earthly ministry was now over. They needed special prayer because the circumstances surrounding Jesus's departure, his betrayal, his arrest, his trial, his beatings, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, all of those things would weigh heavy on the disciples. They needed special prayer because Jesus would not be there in bodily form anymore to help them. They needed special prayer because of the necessary role of the Holy Spirit, both for the sending of the Spirit, 
um, and their constant reliance on the spirit. They needed special prayer because work on earth was almost done. Jesus's work on earth was almost done and he was on his way to heaven. So the disciples needed this prayer that Jesus is praying to the father on their behalf and they need the power of God in order to be kept. They, they, they must be kept continuing as disciples of Jesus. And this was, was not obvious because in Jewish culture, um, when a rabbi died, disciples did not continue to follow that rabbi. Mm. Yet these disciples were expected to continue to be kept as disciples of Jesus even after his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Sisters and brothers, we need Jesus, just like the disciples did, as our intercessor to pray for us, asking God the Father to keep us. And our continuing on in Jesus is not left to our own efforts alone. The world, the flesh, and the devil are so influential, so pervasive, so seductive, that we could never keep ourselves in our own efforts. Even now, if we, if we stay with Jesus, it is only because Jesus has prayed for us, Father, keep them. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm, I'm glad that Jesus prays for us. I'm, I'm glad that even now, as he ascended and is at the right hand of the Father, that Jesus offers intercession on our behalf. We need keeping from division. We need to be kept um, from the evil one. We need to be kept from our own errors. We need to be kept from sin. We need to be kept from hypocrisy. We need to be kept from ourselves because so often we get us in trouble. We mess up, we stray away. We go out the, uh, outside of the ark of safety. We leave God. So the work of keeping a believer is so significant that it takes God, um, the authority of God to do the keeping. Are y'all with me here? So you can't keep yourself. And we, we, gotta, we gotta be honest and open with people. I, don't, I can't keep myself. I'm prone to sin. I'm prone to doing what I think I ought to do in my humanity, in my flesh. Um, so we need God to keep us. Lord, keep me day by day in a pure and perfect way. All right. Um, so, so, so it's it's a significant work that Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays for believers. And the keeping work of God the Father in the disciples would not only keep them in him, but it would also keep them together. Um, you see, Jesus prayed that they would be one, right? I, I, again, that, that's, that's the theme of this conversation at the table. And one after the pattern of the unity of God the Father and God the Son, that they may be one as we are one. Um, the disciples' continued unity could never be assumed um, it would make more sense for the disciples to scatter after the death of Jesus than it would be for them to stay together. The unity that Jesus prayed for among his, his people has a pattern. Watch this. Even as the Father and the Son are one, yet are not the same, we do not expect that genuine Christian unity will be uniformity. See, there's a difference between uniformity and unity. We don't all have to be the same to be unified. And part of the problem that we have in the body is that we expect people to be just like us. But that's, that's, not, that's not unity, that's uniformity. We can all look alike, talk alike, say the same things. We can all act the same way um, in uniformity. But that doesn't mean that we are unified. It, it, it means, um, so what Jesus is speaking of here in terms of unity is unity of the spirit, unity of the heart, 
unity of purpose, unity of destiny. The basis of Jesus's request was rooted in God, in God's ownership of the disciples. He says, those whom you gave me. None of them, um, Jesus says, is lost. Watch this, y'all. Except the son of perdition. There, there was one exception to Jesus's work in keeping the disciples. And that exception was Judas. Um, this was because in fulfillment of the scriptures, Judas was the son of perdition. He was the one destined to evil and destruction. Now, now we won't get into this tonight because this, this is a, a very, uh, this, this conversation regarding Judas is, is a, a Bible study in and of itself. Th there, are, there are two thoughts regarding Judas known as the son of perdition. One is that the noun perdition is the derivative of the verb perished. None perished, but the one who should perish, whose very state and attribute it was to perish. The other thought <laughs> is that the son of perdition points to character rather than destiny. The expression means that he was characterized by lostness, not that he was predestined to be lost. Two different thoughts based on two different views of predestination. Now watch this, sisters and brothers. We, one day, we're going to sit down and have a conversation about predestination because there are some who believe that predestination means that God is the one who makes the determination of where we go, where others go. So in other words, God is the one that says, these are going to heaven, these are going to hell, based on who God is. That's one view of predestination. The other view of predestination is that because of God's foreknowledge, that God knows what choices we will make, and as a result, he knows who's going to make it and who's not going to make it. Two different views of predestination. All right, I'm gonna sit that there. Again, that's a conversation for, for another day. Um, so when we look at when we look at the, <laughs> when we look at when when it says he's the son of perdition, does that mean that God predestined um, Judas to be the 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 betrayer of Jesus, or does that mean that God knew that Judas was going to make the choice to betray Jesus? Brother Jones, I saw your hand. I, I, I saw no, you. I'm not gonna open that up. <laughs> so, so again, that we, we we're gonna we we gotta we gotta have that. We gotta talk through these doctrines, right? We gotta talk through these doctrines. Then um, I will come up with the what the point out the question I was going to ask you because it would have put you on the spot, I think. But I don't want to do that. I know that there's probably an answer to it, so I'm gonna keep my curiosity in check and I'll wait till you bring that conversation up again. Okay, and then you know, um, and then we'll we'll talk about it. All right. Verse 13 picks up. By now I come to you um, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. This is Jesus talking to God. He's praying. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Let me stop there for a moment. Jesus prayed this prayer in full recognition 
of the soon accomplishment of his earthly work. Jesus did not only pray for the keeping of the unity of the disciples, as if he only longed to leave behind good employees. He deeply cared for and prayed for joy fulfilled in their lives. Specifically, watch this, Jesus prayed for his own joy to be fulfilled in his life. So Jesus had a life filled with joy. He spoke, uh, or rather he could speak of, of, of my joy when he's talking to the Father. If he did not, this part of the prayer would make no sense. So truly Jesus was a man of sorrows. Yes, he was acquainted with grief, according to Isaiah. Nevertheless, there was a joy and a satisfaction in the life experience of Jesus that surpassed the joy of any other who ever lived. His joy was, because at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, if, if, if the joy that Jesus has does not far exceed our joy, then how can we have our joy in him? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll let that, all right. His joy was rooted in unbroken fellowship with God the Father. His joy was the fruit of faith, true faith, and confidence in his Father. His joy came from seeing the great things God had done. His joy came from seeing, um, um, uh, his joy rather was not diminished by his own sin. Why? Because he was without sin. His joy was never diminished by deception because he was never deceived. His joy was never diminished by allowing even the smallest foothold to the devil because he never gave room for the devil to give, uh, to, to rather um, um, overtake him or even to, to uh, yeah, I'll say it like that, to overtake him. His joy um, was not rooted in that. His joy was rooted in his relationship with his father. That's what distinguishes his joy from our joy. Because let's be honest, y'all, let something happen, let something come up, let the devil do something, and all of a sudden we are down in the dumps, we can't make it, we don't know what we're going to do, it's the end of the world, all of this stuff begins to overwhelm us and depress us, when our joy ought to be in Jesus. And if Jesus overcome the world, then we too are overcomers. So no matter what we deal with, no matter what we go through, this joy that we have, the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. And we ought to always have joy deep down inside of us. Why? Because joy is a uh, part of the fruit of the spirit. That's another thing, y'all. We got to study the fruit of the spirit too. You ever notice that people say the fruits of the spirit? But it, it, it doesn't say the fruits, plural, of the spirit. It says the fruit of the spirit. All right, that's a whole that's another Bible study too. We'll talk about that. If Jesus was so um, um concerned for joy among his disciples that he prayed for it, we can know that he's also concerned that we have joy. God's purpose is to multiply joy in all of our lives, not to subtract it, not to take it away. The world, the flesh, the devil would tell us something different, but God wants joy fulfilled in each of our lives. Jesus saw himself as a messenger and faithfully delivered the word of God um, so that his disciples understood that the joy that he had in the Father is available to each and every one of them. This, this prayer, this prayer of Jesus cautions us against seeking refuge, hear this, in Christian isolation. Our goal is to be in the world, watch what he says, but not of the world, not of the evil one. Even as a ship is to be in the ocean, but not allowing the ocean to be in the ship. Hear this, if we were taken from the world, the world would be in utter darkness and would perish. Why? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. We're the light of the world. So that means we ought to let our light shine where? In the world. If we were taken from the world, the world would not have us as witnesses to be a means of salvation unto them. So that means we are to be in the world winning souls to Jesus Christ. 
If we were taken out of the world, we would be denied the opportunity to serve Jesus in the same place uh, we have sinned against Jesus. So that means we ought to be serving Jesus in the world with our whole heart so that we can uh, allow our lights to shine before men and they can see our good works but glorify the Father which is in heaven. If we were taken from out of the world, we would not see that there are aspects of God's wisdom, God's truth, God's power, God's grace that are better appreciated on earth rather than they are in the heavens. So if we were taken from the world, we could not show the power of God's grace to persevere or um, um, to, to push us in the midst of, of uh, difficulties, to give us endurance so that we can make it, so that what God has done for us and our testimony can be, there is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he can do for you. God needs us not in isolation, but God needs us in the world. And that's part of the problem with the church, because the church sits in isolation. The church, we come to church every Sunday, we sit in isolation. We come to um, Bible study and we come to all of these different functions and we're in isolation. We're with each other, yes. But when do we ever go out into the world to be the light of the world? When do we ever go out to, into the world so that we can be salt and savor the world? When do we go out and do the work that God had commissioned us to do so that what Jesus is praying for to the Father can be fulfilled. All right. Um, Jonah, Job, Moses, Elijah, they all prayed that they would be taken out the world. But God did not answer their prayer. He wants us to stay in the world so that we can complete the work that he's given our hands to do. A greater work than this. This is all in the Gospel of John, right? Jesus talks about what he has done, and he says, you shall do greater works than these. But, but sisters and brothers, we can't do those works in isolation with one another. Because that's not what we were designed to do. That's not what he's praying for us to do. So Jesus definitely wanted us in the world, um, but he did not want us to be evil. He didn't want us to be marked by the evil one. Jesus didn't pray that we would be taken out of the battle, but that we would be strengthened and protected while we're in the battle. Jesus prayed for his own to be kept from the evil one, the, the world he rules and all of the evil schemes and strategies so that we might be kept from the evil of apostasy, the evil of worldliness, the evil of unholiness. Jesus didn't simply say his people were not of the world. He said they were not of the world even as he was not of the world. In other words, after the same pattern of Jesus, that's how we ought to do. All right, y'all, it's, uh, uh... no, I'm gonna keep going. Give me a couple more minutes. Verse 17 says, sanctify them. This is, this is Jesus still talking to his father. Sanctify them by your truth. Not what people say about it, but your truth. Your word is truth. That's what Jesus says. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Woo. Sanctify, sisters and brothers, watch this, means to set apart for God's special pleasure, special purpose, and for God's use. Yes, it implies holiness, um, but it's being set apart from the corruption of the world for the use of God. Jesus didn't just leave the disciples to sanctify themselves. He prayed for their sanctification. This process as the keeping process is not left to us alone. It's a work of God in us so that God can work through us. 
The dynamic um, behind sanctifi uh, sanctification is truth. The word of God read, the word of God heard, the word of God understood, the word of God applied is truth. The sanctification Jesus had in mind here was not primarily personal holiness. Oh, gosh, I might get in trouble here, but it ain't about just, you know, you walking around, oh, the only thing you drink is orange juice and you so good, you ain't never sinned, you ain't never did nothing wrong. No, that's not what sanctification is about. We have been set apart so that we can do the service of the Lord and the mission of our God. Not so that we can walk around with a fat head and look at other people and look down on other people as if we're all holier than thou and they are nothing. Because at the end of the day, we're all filthy rags. At the end of the day, we're all sinners saved by grace. And the only separating that God is doing for us is he's separating us so that he can use us. Think for a moment how Jesus came and connected to the way that he sends us into the world. Jesus did not come as a philosopher like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, though he knew higher philosophy than all of them. Jesus did not come as an inventor or a discoverer, though he could have invented new things and discovered new lands. Jesus did not come as a conquering king, though he was mightier than Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Jesus came teaching. Jesus came living among us. Jesus came suffering for truth and righteousness. Jesus came to rescue men, women, boys, and girls. Jesus prays for himself. Jesus prays for his disciples. Jesus prays for all of us that we might be like he was in this world, but not of this world, separated for the purpose of being used, not for the purpose of looking down on somebody else, not for the purpose of thinking that we're better than somebody else, not for the purpose of us separating because we're this and they're that. He separates uh, so that we can be used for his glory and that we can share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. All right, now I will stop there. Um, I'll stop there and we'll pick up at verse 20, verse 20 of chapter 17 of the gospel of John. Um, because again, the prayer, he starts by praying for himself. He then prays for his disciples. And now he's going to pray for all believers. Um, and, and we need to see what he says to God, the father about all believers. I'll stop there. Any questions or comments or concerns? Um, we could deal with that now. Somebody put something in the chat and I, I was, wow, I love verse 11. We are always covered. Amen. That's right. That's right. All right. All right. All right, y'all. Yes, brother, brother Jones, I see your hand. How many hours was this pastor? I, I, you know, this was a long conversation at the dinner table. So we're assuming this was a Passover, right? Mm hmm so then we're talking around 6 p.m. or at sundown. And now we know that he, after that, they walked to the Gethsemane. Right. So Gethsemane. about what time was it when they walked to the Yeah. The truth is I have no idea what time it was, but we do know it was in the course of that day. Um, because when Jesus, when they, when they come and arrest Jesus, it's yeah. night. It's around... So yeah, so does it tell us that, what yeah. time it was when they, what hour it was when they arrested him? I don't know. I'd have to okay. look and see what what kind of. Oh, um, this is a lot that he's it. talking about that they've they've heard him say, and it seems like they're quiet now while he's doing all of this. They're still but, at the dinner table. Yeah. What can they say? Well, you remember Peter. Peter was talking at first. Well, right. watch this. The synoptics help us because we know that the first part of the conversation was who was the greatest. Mm -hmm. um, who wanted to be the greatest? Because, you know, they wanted to sit closest to Jesus. Whoever sat close to Jesus must be the greatest. And um, then the conversation moved from who is the greatest to Jesus talking about you got to be whoever wants to be the greatest has to be servant of all. And then after talking about that servanthood, 
Um, that's when we're un we we understand that he had went down and washed the feet mm -hmm. um, of the disciples, and then from there he has that entire discourse. And you remember when we got to the end of chapter sixteen, um, we, we're starting to get to to where he's praying. So now by this time they've gotten up from the table, they're probably walking now. Okay, that's what I'm. And they're probably in the they're probably in the Garden of Gethsemane now. We can you know. Because when we look at the synoptics, the synoptic says that he prayed when he was down in that garden, right? Yes. So, so we can assume that that's where they are now in the garden, and he's praying. Um, and after the prayer, um, that's when we can expect to see Judas and those folks come and and uh, arrest him. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Any Anything else? All right. It's a lot in this prayer. It's a lot. First of all, it's a lot in all of these, you know, it, it's, it's got to be what the past three or four chapters that, that he is, that he is, he is uh, imparting into his disciples to get them to understand that what you're about to see and experience, even though you won't be there, because I already know that you won't be there, um, is, is what is going to propel you to be able to do the ministry that I called you to do in the first place. And when you're converted, when you have come back, when you have really understood the enormity of what this cross um, exemplifies, then this is the work you have to do. And, and, this is, and, and this is how he imparts unto us as disciples today. This is a work, brothers and sisters. This is not, this is not just, hey, I'm saved, we going to heaven. No, this is a work. This is what God calls us to do, to be light in dark places, to love. And, and, and watch this, this next section of the prayer is gonna talk more about love and unity. Two of the biggest things missing in the church. Pastor. Yes, ma'am. I, I like what, um, what you were talking about with the predestination. I think we kind of elaborated. Yeah. We elaborated on that. And you know, you, you're good with giving a teaser and then you set me off to want to research and Right. And look at stuff. And one of the things that um that I looked at before when we had this conversation was in um Ephesians one, mm -hmm. I think it was one in five, when um it talks about God decided decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. See, don't don't get me started. Um now I I, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, oh gosh. So when I when I was when I was first catechized, um, when I was first catechized, I argued, I argued, I said, you know what, what kind of God do we serve that would predestine somebody to heaven and predestine somebody to hell? What kind of God do we serve that would do that? Isn't God a loving God? Isn't oh. God a just and fair God? You know, I said that in my when I was being catechized. It was a Calvinistic view. Um, and and as I am moving in this journey of my life, why can't God do what God wants to do? Amen. God's ways are beyond our ways, his thoughts are beyond our thoughts, right? So why can't God say, these are whom I've chosen to spend eternity with me, these are not? Now, you see, that was a question I was going to open up with about- I know it was, you. I know. <laughs> but I didn't want to go there because that same question is posed to me. But now we just have to accept the fact that he can do whatever he wants to do. That's right. right. And that's the part, that's the part where, where it's difficult for people to kind of comprehend. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm like, you know, if, if we can't fully comprehend eternity, uh -huh. 
how how are we gonna fully comprehend the decisions that God makes or the 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 things that God wants to do? God is sovereign. God mm -hmm. can do whatever God right. wants to do. And it's and so no much scripture. Them. Right. It's so much scripture to back that up. Yes. So Amen. So yeah, but I mean, but but again, you know that 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 really that really deserves some attention. Perchance was Judas a the descendant table. of Cain? I'm sorry. Perchance was Judas a descendant of Cain, the lineage of Cain? I don't know. I'd have to look that up as well. Hmm. I'm not sure. Thank you. Yes, sir. Pastor, that predestined conversation gives me a headache because, <laughs> because God is sovereign. Lord. So he knows like what you the decisions you're going to make mm. before you even make them because it's all a part of his plan. So, I mean, it's so much to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this. it, 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 sure it gives is. me a headache. <laughs> because then you wonder, why does he intervene? Oh, my God. I don't even want to think about that. Right, right. You why know. does he let those things right. happen? You know, why does he let us make a decision that is going to lead us down the road of perdition? <laughs> See that? But I think that's part of our processing. That's part of our growing. Like, you know, if you haven't been through something, you know what I mean. Like, how yeah. can you, you know, I don't know. I think it's part of the learning process. Part of you because you never, you never really stop growing and god has to teach us things and some of us are more hard-headed than others and then some of us you got to push you know what i mean so it's just so much to it that's why i said it could give you a headache yeah I but guess, in order for us to appreciate our salvation we have to understand that that's yes. something that we do have to go through amen right, right. that's another that's another thing right there if we can't um, if we can't fully understand salvation, you you know we we're, we're 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 still growing in understanding the enormity of what salvation really is. Mm, that's right. You, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. salvation, like it's nothing of ourselves. Yeah. We, there's we have nothing to do with it. That's right. Nothing. That's you, you it. Know what I mean? Um. It goes and, right and, back. And that's a hard concept to understand. It goes right back to, to the scripture where he said the day workers, he tells them, it's mine to do what I want to do with. See, thank so you. We are his, so he uses whoever he wants to for whatever he wants us to do. Right. Some of us get mad because we've been in church all our lives, mm -hmm. right? And we going and and we feel like, oh, we deserve, you know, to get to heaven and everything. And then somebody gonna be on their deathbed and make it in. And, and somebody gonna get mad. Well, I was there the whole time. You know, we got the elder son syndrome. We got the the the, the oh, syndrome mm -hmm. of the servants. You know who the the um that that Deacon Chess was talking about. The the uh the master says to them, "Listen, I need I need day workers." And there's some that came and worked all day. There's some that came and worked at the last hour, right? And they That's all got the too. same wage. Yeah. How does that make mm -hmm. sense? <laughs> you know, the thieves were on the cross, found salvation in the last minute. That's but right. Judas can't has there's no hope for him. That's a little sad to think about. Unless there is. I you know, that was a question I was gonna ask you. When it came to uh predestination, does that mean that Judas will never be able to enter heaven? So that is the challenging question. And here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. What we have to come to grips with is that we don't have absolutes. No, sir. Right. And because God is sovereign and because God can do what he wants and because we don't fully comprehend sovereignty and what sovereignty can and cannot do, has done and will do, sometimes we can't answer those questions. Well, we'll promise to find out by and by. By and by. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I saw a question from in the chat from Sister Chamberlain, and I don't know if she's going to ask that too because I see her hand raised. She asked about the unit of time. Like our minute or our hour 
um, deals with 60, 60 minutes. Um, and the thing is, that that's another, another thing, is that calendars were different. What calendar we use? Do we use the Roman calendar? Do we use the Gregorian calendar? You know, do we use, there's different calendars. One of the things that we can um, say is that the Bible says in the beginning and the evening and the morning was a day. day. Mm -hmm. So day started at night and went to the next, to the next day and um, to the next evening time. And that was considered a day. Okay. So wherein we may not be able to know the exact hours, we do know that night and day was was a day, right? Mm -hmm. Which is which is how the three days can be explained. Because Thursday night to Friday, one day. Friday to Saturday, two days. Saturday to Sunday, three days. Because night and then morning was a day. What we do now day and night <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so so yeah 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 sister chamberlain i'm sorry if i if, if that was or wasn't your question your hand is up come on on and uh and ask your question unmute yourself yeah i i have this discussion practically daily with my wife. Practically every single day, we talk about some aspect of, of God's sovereignty and our limited understanding of God and how, for me, there are less and less absolutes um, so, so yeah, let me see if I can find you and maybe I can try to unmute you. Yeah, I, it's not allowing me to unmute you either, Sister Chamberlain. We can only ask her to unmute herself. Oh, okay. <clears throat> But yeah, so so these these are questions, you know, these are burning questions that you know we can seek the seek the the holy writ about and and pray for understanding. But but at the end of the day, there's gonna be a whole lot of stuff that we we not gonna understand until we get the glory. All right. Anybody, anybody else? Any questions, comments, concerns? If not, then I, I will, I will decrease. <laughs> Brother Jones, you had your hand up again. Yes, sir. Yes. Is there any reason to believe that when Jesus lifted up his eyes to the heavens, that he was seeing through into heaven? You know, I don't know. <laughs> but there's no, there's no, there's, you haven't run across any doctrine as to any opinion as to that. That's, that, that's an interesting thought. I haven't even, no, I haven't run into anything, but, you know, that's certainly something that, that we could, you know, look for to see, but. Well, we know one of the martyrs was able to, before he, he saw. Right. He up and so I, you know, I was just curious to know. Right. Was he in direct communication at that point, or could we draw any conclusion on that? Yeah, I mean, then watch this. But then, then we have to think about that for a minute. You know, if Jesus is God, he got to be. Yeah. Does, does he have to see God? To... No. Okay. That's just the right. point. <laughs> you know, he's a, he's God right there. They were in contact by yeah. virtue of him being who he was. Yeah, I, see, I mean that's the only way I can see that. See, that's the that's that that is that's another issue when we look at humanity. You know, because every reference that we make with respect to God is through human understanding. 
So, you know, when we talk about God, God has eyes. No, according to John, God is a spirit. You know what I mean? Um, so that doesn't mean that God, God, God has hands. God has feet. You know, no, no, that's anthropomorphism. We're giving God human characteristics. You know, so even our understanding of God is sometimes skewed because we expect God to operate in a human way. I'm 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 done if there's I'm done. As we pray tonight, God has looked beyond all of our faults and so our needs to be here tonight. And as we gather tonight, he knows just what's best for all of us. We have been here long enough to know that he sees and he hears. And he knows where our hearts are at. So we can't fool God. We fool ourselves by not doing what he tells us to do, to pray for each other. So as we love each other tonight, bow our heads and thank God that we are still walking, we are still talking, and we still listen. On tonight, dear God, forgive all of us for our shortcomings and our sins. Forgive our family members, oh God, who haven't fell in love with you and changed their ways to what you would have them to be. And as you look at me tonight, as I bow my head for those families whose loved ones have fallen asleep, they have laid, been laid to rest, oh God, and they have no more troubles. We ask your blessings upon their families as they lay in the graves tonight. Whatever their needs are, whatever pains they are going through, only you can help each one of us tonight. So as we look at each other, our wives, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, there's something wrong with all of us. But you look beyond our faults and let our golden moments roll on a little longer. You have been blessing our churches, our schools, our government, our president, our vice president, you have been blessing America, oh God. We don't know what trouble is because we haven't seen what you are allowed to happen in our lives. Many of us have been in the hospital, but you brought us out. Many of us have went to our doctors and had received sad news, but you still keep it air and the blood running warm in our veins. And we just want to say thank you. We thank you for the food that you have allowed us to eat, the medicine you have allowed us to take. You're such a good God. You know what we need better than we need know ourselves. So no matter how long we stay up on the this earth, we are never find out all about you. So on tonight, as we lie down, we pray, oh God, you give us a good night's sleep. We pray that you protect our soldiers in foreign land and here in America. We pray, oh God, for our police who are walking the streets and riding up and down the highway. We pray for them tonight. We charity pray tonight, oh God, for our leaders in our churches. Preachers are being called into judgment. Men's been called into judgment. Soldiers been called into judgment. You are God all by yourself. And we just thank you for taking care of us. 
So we ask your blessings upon your people on tonight, that whatever we need and whatever we desire, if we hold to a yield, unchanging hand, you will bring us through. Thank you, Lord, for this night and this time. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining St. John's Zoom Bible Study this evening. We pray tonight's lesson and discussion was thought-provoking and inspiring. We hope you join us next week. Until then, continue following Christ in all that you do.